Okay, thanks. Uh, first of all, must I did not actually invent the word Anthropocene. It's, it's, this is a, I wish maybe I should have because it's quite clever, but it's, it's actually in the current literature on earth sciences. There's even journals of the Anthropocene now. So this is a, something that the scientists do talk about quite a bit. But I'll, <clears throat> in a few minutes, I'll explain what it means. Um, so uh, so I, I have sort of a semi-formal talk, and I'll switch between my talk and the slides and kind of ad lib a little bit too as I go along. Uh, so again, thanks uh, very much everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, thanks to the Faculty of Arts and Science for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's quite an honor. I'm going to give you a philosopher's perspective on climate change and energy. And by the end of the evening, I may end up saying some things that will not make me very popular. Um, well, part of my job description as a philosopher is to occasionally be un unpopular. And uh, we philosophers know that, uh, you know, someday we might have to drink the cup of hemlock. It's sort of an occupational hazard. Although actually tonight after the talk, I'm hoping I can get away with a beer. So um, the one thing I'm not going to do very much tonight is rant about Mr. Trump and his various trolls and minions. Um, well, a, a little bit, but not much. Uh, it's too easy. Uh, uh, instead, I want to do something harder, which is take a good look at ourselves and where we stand in the big world around us. Now, a colleague of mine uh, begged me to not get too technical. Um, I don't know how technical is too technical, but I will say in advance, and you can call this a trigger warning if you like, uh, that uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight are very frightening and uncomfortable. And, and I guess that as a philosopher, it's also my job to deliver philosophical messages. So here's my first message. We are all, all adults in this room, and part of being adult is being willing to face unpleasant truths and then deal with them as honestly as we can. So to illustrate this point, I'll show you a few quotes. So just a few weeks ago, the Prime Minister made this statement. He said, we can't shut down the oil sands tomorrow. We need, we need to phase them out. We need to manage the transition off our dependence on fossil fuels. And this uh, got him in a lot of trouble, and the, the Premier said, the, uh, among other things, said the following. Today I was asked about the future of the oil sands. How long into the future will the world need oil? Here's what I'd like to say. Oil and gas will help power the global economy for generations to come. Alberta's oil and gas industry and the people who work in it are the best in the world, and we're not going anywhere anytime soon. And then uh, Brian Jean said, Trudeau's speculation on how and when to shut down the oil sands can only be seen as a direct attack on Alberta. All right, so, um, okay, now I'm not going to respond directly to what Mr. Jean said. I'm, I don't think it deserves a response, but what Ms. Notley said has to be taken very seriously. So she and her colleagues insist they, they do not deny the, the science of climate. Uh, they have introduced a carbon tax. They are taking steps to phase out coal by 2030. However, her government's climate leadership plan will allow carbon emissions from the tar sands to increase from their present se roughly 70 megatons a year to 100 megatons a year by 2030. And now she says that humanity will be using oil and gas for generations. Who is right, Ms. Notley or Mr. Trudeau? And what is, by the way, uh, an economically and environmentally responsible level of tar sands emissions by 2030? And also, what is the Anthropocene? Well, I will, as I promised, I will get to that. Um, I just before I get into all these, I think I should briefly give some a bit of personal background. Um, you might ask, what are my qualifications, if any, to speak on climate and energy policy? I'm not a climate or environmental scientist. Uh, as philosophers go, I'm pretty scientifically literate. Um, I did my PhD on the foundations of quantum mechanics a long time ago. I have published a number of professional papers and books that straddle the boundary between scientific topics, things like history and foundations of physics and ecology, and also philosophy. However, I don't know how to code up a general circulation model. I have not spent years of my life trekking across the ice caps like some of the scientists I've had the privilege to meet. So if I have any particular expertise at all, it's in two areas. So first, I've spent my whole work, working life as a philosopher, as, as uh, Dr. Cooper suggested, trying to see connections. To, put together the biggest possible picture of the human situation in our puzzling and amazing universe. <clears throat> I take it as a key part of my job uh, to, to hunt out the connections between different disciplines that many specialized scholars and scientists are literally too busy to look for. I think I've gotten fairly good at this after many years of practice, though heaven knows I'm not infallible. 
But I ought to be reasonably good at this sort of connection seeking because that is a major part of the job description of a philosopher to see the big picture, the long range picture, to see what it all comes to if one can. Second, as a philosopher and historian of science and as a frequent teacher of logic and occasional researcher in logic, I should have become pretty good, by now, pretty expert in telling good reasoning from bad. Obviously, there are many technical issues on which I'm not equipped to have an opinion, but I'm pretty good at judging the quality of a piece of alleged reasoning. Of course, I can be fooled, and only a fool would claim infallibility. But even though I'm not an expert in climate science, I think I'm reasonably expert at telling who is. I know something about how science works. In particular, and this is very important given today's media discourse and political discourse, I know some, science has an ethic of truthfulness. Scientists are human beings, they make mistakes, they have their quirks and foibles like the rest of us. But they also have long training in telling the truth as best they can determine it. It's drilled into them. In this respect, they're like medical doctors. Doctors as well are merely human, but again, they are rigorously trained to follow a professional ethic that requires them to tell the truth, even if it is an uncomfortable or inconvenient truth. The idea that climate science is some sort of vast international conspiracy designed to trump up research grants, oh, I said charge, Trump, sorry, designed to trump up research grants or impose world socialism or something like that is based upon a colossal ignorance of how science and scientists actually work. For me, this is personal as well. Here's a comment that I saw yesterday evening. So there's a climate-denying physicist named William Happer who may be appointed as Mr. Trump's science advisor. Recently, Happer said, there's a whole area of climate so-called science that is really more like a cult. It's like Hare Krishna or something like that. They're glassy-eyed and they chant. Okay, so um, now I've been to several professional meetings of cl climate science and earth scientists. Uh, my colleague, Dr. James Byrne, over there hooked me up with the American Geophysical Union a few years ago. So I've gone and hung out with some real earth scientists. I, had, I missed the chanting sessions, though. Jim didn't invite, invite, invite me to the chanting sessions. And I didn't see very many glassy eyes, either. Um, in fact, I'm fortunate to know many earth and climate scientists personally, including many among my colleagues here at U of L. There's not a Harry Krishna devotee among them. They're, they're all over the political spectrum. By the way, that. Climate scientists are not all left-wing, either. There's a, they're all over the map politically, and I know a few who are quite conservative politically. But they're good scientists, and they tell the truth. All right? um, Earth scientists, are, as a group, tend to be, well, very down-to-earth people. Um, I find glaciologists to be especially impressive. <clears throat> they do things like spend weeks and months in appalling conditions on top of the Greenland or Antarctic ice caps, painstakingly taking samples, measurements, and drill cores so that the rest of us can know the facts that we desperately need to know. For reasons that I will explain, glaciology could be the most important subject in the world right now. So my point is, I not only know something about how science really works, I also know something from first-hand acquaintance about the impressive quality of the scientists themselves. Okay, enough of ranting. Uh, Rick Mercer does it better than I do. I'm, let's talk about climate science first and then energy. Um, so I'm just going to show you a few points here. This is going to call it the, what is more or less the current consensus as I've been able to pick up. These are the things that the majority of competent working scientists in climate and related topics do accept. Later on I'm going to talk about some other things that are more or less certain. But these are the things that as far as we know are extremely well established. First of all, carbon dioxide is the long-term control knob for global temperature because of its contribution to the greenhouse effect. There are other greenhouse gases, such as water vapor, which are more powerful in the short term. They're called fast feedbacks, that's the technical term. But CO2 is the slow, steady burn. It's the one that gets you over centuries and millennia. <clears throat> Second, the planet has been warming since the early 20th century, such that we are now about 1 to 1.1 degrees C above pre-industrial levels, depending on exactly how you define the pre-industrial baseline. Um, and in early 2016, uh, about a year ago, we were about 1.35 degrees C over due to the intense La Nina that was just wrapping up at the time. And uh, climate scientists were freaking. Because remember, Canada agreed to that we would, as an aspirational goal, that we would hold, our, hold the temperature increase to 1.5, and here we were already up to 1.35, right? Well, it's cooled down just a little bit since then as the La Nina has settled down, but the, the trend continues. So here's a very recent graph from NASA Goddard. 
uh, taken three days ago. Um, you can see the ups and downs. So the, the last coldest year was about 1909 or something like that, or 1910, and steadily zigzagging up just like that since then. Um, fortunately, uh, the, this NASA Goddard has a superb website with climate information on. Fortunately, it hasn't been taken down yet. It's, it's still there. Maybe it'll be gone tomorrow, but it's still there right now. Um, let me see where, where, where am I here. So, okay, let me just talk a bit about some, some numbers here. One thing you can pick off the website is, see this little bump here? That is the peak temperature in the summer of 1998 when the last La Nina went by. It was really hot then. This is where we are now. This is 2016's number. 2017's not on there yet. You can see it zigzags up and down. And one of the tropes that we've already heard is, all, all, we've heard so many times is, oh, it hasn't warmed in 18 years. Well, if you look at, if you do the, do the math and pick the numbers off this chart, what you'll have to actually get is that from that peak to this point here, it's warmed about 0.35 degrees C. And, you know, you might say 0.35 degrees C, I wouldn't even feel that if I was standing outside, but averaged over the whole planet, that makes a big difference. Okay, so, um, so further points of consensus, uh, the, the current warming is caused mostly by CO2 emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels, although deforestation plays a role as well. Um, and these, this warming trend is not caused by increases in solar output. It is not caused by volcanic emissions of CO2, cosmic rays, clouds, orbital variations, or random variation in the climate system. Don't worry, all these possibilities have been exhaustively checked by hundreds, thousands of scientists who are very, very expert over a period of many years. Um, so it's not like they suddenly go, oh my God, we forgot to check the volcanoes. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's, this is what, what, they're, sh what they're getting. <clears throat> now there's another very important thing called Arctic amplification. So the, the, the uh, temperature increase, you know, one degree or so, uh, doesn't sound too much, but it's not spread around uniformly over the globe. It, it, it tends to be higher in the Arctic. This was pr predicted by scientists decades ago, and now it's what, what we're actually seeing. Um, the, they know the Arctic ice cap is melting much, much faster than anybody's modeling had pr predicted. Um, and who cares? Well, I mean, it displaces a few walruses and polar bears to be sure, but the global significance in particular is that uh, this melting forms a powerful positive feedback to warming since, and what I mean by positive feedback, it's something that makes it worse, all right? So open sea absorbs two to three times as much solar energy as shiny ice, right? And one, so the, the amount of ice on the planet generally is one of the other important control knobs for temperature. When ice goes down, the planet gets warmer, and if, particularly if we're talking about sea ice, because the seawater absorbs a lot of heat. So as the uh, Arctic ice cap gets smaller, uh, it, the Arctic Ocean is absorbing uh, more solar energy and among other things that may be leading to some of the bizarre weather that the world has been experiencing now. Now this is more the area of uncertainty. The scientists aren't totally sure of that. But you may be aware that while we here in Lethbridge were pretty cold around Christmas, the, the, uh, the North Pole was close to zero degrees centigrade. It's like 30 to 40 degrees above its normal temperature zone. Right? And again, the scientists are extremely worried about this. A further aspect of Arctic amplification is the, the methane. So methane is trapped in permafrost, it's trapped in uh, deposits in the shallow coastal areas of the uh, sort of continental shelf areas of the Arctic. A lot of methane is being released by, as permafrost melts and as the Arctic warms up. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse, greenhouse gas, much more powerful than, than CO2. Um, and it's been released at a, a, at a very concerning rate, and it's a further positive warming feedback. Now, um, there's quite a, been a fair bit of discussion in the professional literature about the significance of methane. There, a couple of years ago, there were a, couple, a few scientists who envisioned something that was called the, the methane burp, right? They, they could imagine a context in which huge amounts of methane would be released from melting permafrost, etc., in a very short period of time, 
and it would cause an incredible spike in global warming that would essentially wipe out life on Earth. And um, <clears throat> now the current feeling, my again, I'm not an expert in this, but I've listened to the experts. The current feeling on this is that that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> probably, uh, uh, but still they know the methane is steadily being released at a steadily increasing rate and it is a powerful greenhouse gas. So another one of the things that's difficult to figure into the calculations is the effect of methane, except that it's, not, it's just not good. That, that's, that's the, 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 well, we, know, we know that for sure. As, and <clears throat> scientists have a saying, what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic, right? Okay, so now let's talk about the oceans a little bit. So about 90% or more of the excess heat actually goes into the oceans, not into the atmosphere. And when we get these sort of warming and cooling phases like El, La Nina, El Nino, that's heat being exchanged between the oceans and the atmosphere in a sort of turbulent manner. Um, all this heat in the oceans uh, poses severe threats to the stability of the ice caps. And I'll, I'm going to come back to this question in a minute. Another thing that's happening, excess CO2 is increasing the oceanic acidity to the point at which it is actually a threat to many marine organisms, particularly those little teeny tiny calcareous organisms which are at the base of the food chain, the krill and the calcareous phytoplankton and those little guys that we sort of need to stay alive. Okay, another, so another thing that again is generally accepted, high water. At, by now, the sense I get is it's virtually certain that there will be at least half a meter to a meter of sea level rise by the end of this century, even if emissions are drastically curtailed in the near future. Now, that figure is somewhat uncertain, but this figure of a half a meter to a meter is uh, strongly emphasized, a conservative estimate. Conservative estimate, all right? Um, you've all heard of the IPCC, Inter Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They had published their big report about three years ago. Um, their, their sea level predictions were very conservative because they did not take into account something called ice sheet dynamics, which is they don't know how to model how ice sheets collapse. So they, they felt they couldn't put it in their predictions because they weren't sure enough about it. So, so this figure of a half a meter to a meter depends on the, on the precise so-called emission scenario. But again, that's a conservative projection not taking into account possible ice sheet dynamics. Sea level rise is one of the wild cards in this story. I'll come back to that. So there's this concept of a so-called guardrail. So it is uh, this, you've all heard this figure of global, we try to keep global mean temperature, uh, that is the, 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 the increase, uh, not above two degrees C. So as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're past one now. We're one to 1.1. 1 .1. um, it's felt that this, uh, this um, Two degree C marker is a sort of magic guardrail, and beyond that point, uh, we don't want to go beyond that point because things could accelerate out of control. Things like ice, ice sheet collapse, uh, methane release, etc., could accelerate out of control, being nothing that anybody could do at a certain point. Um, but one thing that, that's rather sobering is that this two degree C figure was essentially an educated guess dating from the 1990s. Right? It's, it's not well established. And quite a few scientists think that it's way too high. So, so um, as I mentioned, Canada at the Paris Treaty in the fall of 2015 agreed to a so-called aspirational limit of 1.5 degrees C, but emissions will have to be much, much further curtailed to have the slightest hope of reaching this goal. And it could still be too high for reasons I'll explain. But Paris was only a start. So um, there was this great treaty, a fabulous photo op, you know, Everybody was very happy. They had a great party, right? Um, they agreed to, most, many nations of the world agreed to certain emissions reductions, but people have done the math. The emissions at reductions that were agreed to are only sufficient to hold the temperature increase to roughly 3 degrees C. They don't, they don't even get us to 2, let alone less than 2. So much stronger cuts are needed very soon. But it remains very, very uncertain whether the major, major industrial countries, including Canada, are even going to make their already agreed to uh, INDC. So INDC is bureaucratic jargon. It means intended nationally determined contributions. That's the, how much each individual country agreed to cut their contributions. Okay, so concept of the Anthropocene at last. So just with that, again, th that's the background. Those are the things that most climate scientists pretty well would agree on, maybe with some minor variations. 
This concept of the Anthropocene, what the term means is it, it's supposed to suggest, um, just organize my notes here, it's, uh, it's a new geological epoch defined by the human impact on the Earth system. So what's the point? Well, people, scientists have realized if we should all just disappear tomorrow morning, every single human person just disappear, the record of our being here will be in the geological record for the rest of the history of life on Earth. The, the way we've changed the Earth's crust, the climatic effects, the effects in the oceans, our pollutants, radioactive waste, all kinds of things. They're in, they are going to be in the rock strata now, forever, as long as the Earth exists. So we've defined a new geological epoch. It's, I believe this term is not sort of officially accepted yet by the, uh, geo, there's some society that decides that, right? But, but it's very widely used by Earth scientists now. Uh, uh, here's a picture of the Grand Canyon just to illustrate the point. So this is just a stock shot of the Grand Canyon, all right? We've all seen this. Um, you're looking at roughly a billion years worth of, of geological history here from, the, from up here down to the, the depths. And you see all these beautiful rock strata. Well, that, mo every one of those rock strata, those beautiful lines in the rock, or certainly most of them, represent a mass extinction in the history of life on Earth. It's, it's a point where something came down, and it's usually got to do with the greenhouse effect. Well, we know some of them, at least one major mass extinction was related to a, a, a giant meteor hit the Earth, but it may have also caused a climate catastrophe. These, m many of these mass extinctions, maybe most of them, are due to climate effects. Uh, usually involving too much CO2 in too short a period of time. Okay, now what the scientists are telling us is that we are currently in the middle of creating a mass extinction. They call it the sixth extinction because they're in the history of life on Earth. There were five major pulses of extinction and a whole bunch of little ones too. Uh, and if you do the math, you look at the numbers, the biologists, the Earth scientists are telling us we are creating the sixth extinction. And there's an extremely good book on it here, Elizabeth Colbert's Six, Six Extinction, which I think won the Pulitzer Prize, published about two years ago, uh, Read and Weep. It's an incredibly tragic story. It's, it's, it's painful to read this book, right? So what does the Anthropocene really mean? Okay, what it means is that one of these little extinction lines here, we own one of those. One of those is ours, right? So it could mean other things, maybe it could even have some good meanings, but to begin with, it means we, we get a mass extinction to ourselves. Okay. Okay, so with that background, I wanted to get... Now, I'm not going to talk too much about this. I mean, this whole issue of species extinction, loss of biodiversity is incredibly important, but it's not my main topic tonight. And so I'm going to move on to other things, but I, it's not because I think this is unimportant. It's just that there's other things I should talk about, but it's... It's a, it's a really important issue. Okay, I want to get back and talk about sea level and glaciers and things like that. Um, and this is the, the one part that does get a little tiny bit technical, but it's not, not impossible to, to, to cope with. There's a thing called marine ice sheet instability. Now, I'm not a glaciologist, so maybe I won't explain this exactly correctly, but you can get the basic idea. So the basic idea is that when you look at, say, Antarctica or Greenland, um, um, there's three kinds of ice. There's floating ice shelves. When they melt, they do not change sea level because they're already floating. There's ice that's on top of the land. So, for example, are the Columbia ice fields just up the road from us here. So when the Columbia ice fields melt, if they melt, of course that water runs into the sea and it will, of course, raise water level. But there's a third kind of ice. And actually, th three years ago, I didn't even know this myself. And I was going to some of these meetings and my climate scientist friends were telling me, you know, you should learn something about this, and they were giving me some books and papers to, re to, re to read. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues here at U of L gave me some very valuable background as well. So, uh, what is marine ice sheet instability? Well, there's there's a third kind of ice, all right. And what what this is, if you have a deep trench, an abyssal trench, all right. So, for example, West Antarctica, there's a central basin in West Antarctica. It's roughly the size of Mexico. It goes down to two and a half kilometers below sea level, and it's packed solid with ice up to about a kilometer above sea level. Now, how is that possible? Because I thought ice floated, right? Well, the reason it's possible is they think, basically, as far as we understand, during a, co a, a, 
a, a cooling phase thousands and thousands of years ago, a lot of ice gets trapped in this basin and it can't flow out to sea as fast as it's building up. So it piles up until it, by the sheer weight of its, it's called, the technical term is ice overflotation. The sheer weight of ice presses it down on the seafloor. And then it keeps snowing, so it just keeps adding to it and adding to it and adding to it. So, so you've got this huge chunk of ice there, which is far more ice than can float in that area, if you like. And then if that ice should collapse, if it should melt, it will definitely raise the water level. Right? So, so, so there's a central basin in West Antarctica. There's, well, that's just, well, getting to, to, in too much detail, West Antarctica has two major basins. There's about three big ones in East Antarctica they're really worried about, and three or four similar ice masses in Greenland. And the one in West Antarctica, for example, it's often just called the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, is good for about 3.3 meters of sea level rise. They've done the math. If you translate the ice over flotation into water and spread it around the Earth, give or take 3.3 meters, um, the ones in Greenland are good for quarter of a meter, half a meter, here and there. Uh, East Antarctica, if ever goes, a lot more, a lot more. All right, so, so, so here's the issue. These marine ice sheets, they can last for thousands of years. They can be stable for thousands and thousands of years as long as they're protected from the open sea by their ice shelves. But what's happening now, and they've really, particularly in West Antarctica, since the late 90s, is that the, the ocean water is warmer and there's these warm currents coming up and they're eating away at the ice sheets from below, right? And the ice sheets are, are losing their protective skirt, if you like. I mean, you can think of these ice sheets as almost like a cork in a champagne bottle. It's holding back the flow of the ice, right? And, and these ice sheets are breaking down. There's a huge chunk that's about to break off Larsen Sea right now. You might have seen this in the news. Larsen Sea is one of the major ice sheets up there in, in Antarctica. And there's, a, there's a chunk roughly the size of Prince Edward Island that's almost right any day now it's going to break off. Okay, so, so, so what, what, what the physics shows, what paleoclimate, that's the, paleoclimate is the study of ancient climates. What the geology shows is that these ice sheets can be stable for tens of thousands of years, but if conditions are right, they can blow apart very, very quickly. And exactly how quickly is the $64,000 question right now, okay? So under current warming conditions, from what I understand, there is a virtual certainty that they will eventually collapse slowly over a period of a few centuries. Maybe five, I don't know, five centuries, six centuries, three centuries, they're not exactly sure. But there is some possibility that they could blow apart suddenly within weeks or months, particularly West Antarctica. They're really worried about West Antarctica. Um, okay, so the problem is, the, the, the physics of it, the, it's really an, an engineering issue, is it, they don't know exactly how to predict exactly when this could occur. How much more melting, how much is it going to take before the West Antarctic ice sheet essentially falls in the sea? We don't know. We just don't know. Okay? So here's a nice little uh, sketch to give you a sense of how this works. So here's the Pine Island Glacier, which is one of the major glaciers in um, West Antarctica. Um, so here's its ice shelf. The ice shelf is calving, breaking off. It's called calving. And you get these warm waters coming up from deep in the sea, which are, which are very, very warm, and they're eating away at the ice from below. This little point here is called the grounding, li the grounding line. And the grounding line is, is so it's where the glacier has it's stuck on the seafloor, right? And the, and the grounding lines are, have gone back by several kilometers on, on many, many of these glaciers, just in the last 15 to 20 years. And the paradox is, this is what fools people, up here it could still be really cold. Like it might be minus 50 or something up here, but it's plus 4 down here, right? And that's death to ice sheets. So this is what they're, what they're observing right now. Now here's a shot of the, of the Pine Island Glacier in November 2013. Um, so this, this direction is, um, well this is, see, down here this is the South Pacific, so the South Pole is over about here, <laughs> and um, this is a huge piece of the shelf that calved off, so this is actually about 20 kilometers by 45 kilometers, that's how big that piece of ice is. This was taken by a satellite picture. Oh, I forgot, NASA faked it, right? Didn't they? Oh yeah, those scientists, yeah, they faked it. Okay, they got together with Pixar animation, but 
if anyway, no, they, they, they didn't fake it. They didn't fake it. Okay, so, so this is a huge chunk. Now again, because it's floating ice in and of itself, it does not raise sea level. But what it does is it means the rest of the, of the glaciers, so back here, going back up that direction roughly, that's where the rest of the glaciers, it can now flow faster. And it's easier for that warm seawater to get underneath it. Another thing they've discovered is a lot of these big ice sheets, they actually have deep channels going on hundreds of meters below sea level. They have these channels like grooves cut into the seafloor that can take warm seawater right under the heart of the, of the ice sheet. Well, it gets technical, and there's, there's a... The, there's a lot to it, and I don't want to get into all of that. I think you see the point. As a philosopher, I really appreciated this statement. So this is from a book by a gentleman named Henry Pollack, who is a professional glaciologist, and he published a book called A World Without Ice. Nature's best thermometer, perhaps its most sensitive and unambiguous indicator of climate change, is ice. When ice gets sufficiently warm, it melts. It ice asks no questions, presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debates. It is not burdened by ideology and carries no political baggage as it crosses the threshold from solid to liquid. It just melts, right? And the only question is how fast and when, <laughs> okay? So, um, so put in my own words, message from Mother Nature, if you like, we humans live in this vast physical universe that has its own rules, which we only partially understand. But here's, I think, a rule that we, we, we can understand. Nature does not schedule events in accordance with what would be economically or politically convenient for a small province in Canada. Okay? And yet, maybe we have to deal with it. Now, a couple more specific messages I could, I could point to. Uh, I mean, this gets worse. I, I'm only halfway through, okay? Um, <laughs> message from the Eemian. So what is the Eemian? Well, again, this is another technical term that Earth scientists use. The Eemian was the last interglacial. So every 100 to 120,000 years is a brief warming period, 10,000, 20,000 years long, when the ice melts back, the Earth gets quite warm for a little while, it is triggered by orbital changes but amplified by carbon dioxide concentration. That's the short story of why these things happen. Um, the la in the last interglacial, about 120 years ago, 20,000 years ago, what they, what the, they're getting some interesting numbers. CO2 was actually much less than it is now. It was under 300 parts per million. We're at over 400. Okay, uh, the, the, the reading four days ago was 406 at Mauna Loa. The reading four days was 406. So um, we're at th un the Eemian was under 300 parts per million. The temperature, and this is really interesting, was only, it was either virtually the same as what we have now or just a little bit higher. They're not sure. It's hard to tell. They're working on this. Sea level was apparently six to nine meters higher. They think most of that water would have come from West Antarctica with some major contributions from Greenland. Okay, so they're not sure. But, and again, it's difficult to estimate sea level from 100,000 years ago, so, you know, there's a huge literature on this. It's extremely technical. I just kind of skim through and pick out the high points, but, you know, that's the general picture they're getting with a fair degree of reliability. So we are at or close to late Eemian conditions now, today. It's not like we're going to get there. We are there, right? Therefore, what you can say is something that happened, this is not just science trivia, okay? You know, you get... I get a couple of science news feeds where you get these inter interesting little bits of science trivia that come in your inbox every day. This is not just trivia. What happened 120,000 years ago has direct implications for our economic policy today. Because if we're in this very similar climatic conditions that produced six to nine meters of sea level rise, we, we need to know that. That affects the decisions that we make. Now, let's, it gets worse. So if we go back a bit further, there's an earlier geological era called the Pliocene. Um, this is about three to five million years ago. Now, one thing they found is that there's a, fair, a reasonably good correlation between CO2 levels and sea levels. Not perfect, but reasonably good. If you go back to the Pliocene, three to five million years ago, uh, CO2 was something like 400. They're not, again, obviously exactly sure, but that's the picture they seem to have. Sea level was 15 to 25 meters higher. All right, so they think that at that point some of the major basins in East Antarctica must have collapsed as well. This only lasted for a couple of thousand years and then it got cold again. So this is kind of the end of the Eemian. But, um, 
you know, 15 to 25 meters, that's, uh, you know, in Florida they talk about nuisance flooding, right? They don't, you can't use the word sea level rise in Florida, it's politically very unacceptable to talk about sea level rise, it's supposed to be called um, nuisance flooding. So, 25 meters of sea level rise would be a damn nuisance, right? Which is, okay. So, what do we do about this? I mean, it's, we don't know. It could be that in order to prevent this sort of catastrophic sea level rise, catastrophic temperature rise, um, it's not good enough to stabilize CO2 at 400 to 450 parts per million. Uh, it's imperative we reduce CO2 to 350 or even 300. We have no idea how to do that. Well, general sketchy idea. Um, I was going to talk about temperatures, and I just, uh, sorry, I had something in my notes here that I didn't, I didn't put on the slide. Let me just... So, yeah. Oh, yeah, let's, let, I'll men mention this now. Talk about temperature. All right, ice melt is a very dramatic sign of, of a problem, but temperature is, don't forget about temperature. In the summer of 2015, the temperature in southern Iraq briefly hit over 60 degrees centigrade. Okay, personally, I would be dead if that happened. I'd just be a puddle on the floor. Um, it didn't last too long, fortunately, but you know, if, if you get that happening more often, if you get areas of the world where there is consistently temperatures in the 50s or even low 60s, right, people can't live there. Forests will explode and burn. Grasslands will burn. You know, people, agriculture will be impossible. Um, people will have to flee. Where will they go, right? So if you put temperature increase together with possibly drastic sea level rise. We're, we're right now we have about 20 million refugees in the world today. The world is not doing, I'm, I know we've gen, people have taken a bunch here in, in Canada, a few, a few thousand, a few tens of thousands. Some of my friends have been involved in that effort. It's a very generous thing. What are we going to do if there's millions of people trying to get into Canada? I mean, I'm not saying we should keep them out. I'm just saying what are we going to do? I'm just raising the question. Right? There, there, this, these climatic conditions could produce not just 20 million refugees, they could produce 50 or 100 or million or more, perhaps in a very short period of time, particularly if the West Antarctic ice sheet lets go, which again is a matter of uncertainty. So, um, so um, where are we here? So, <clears throat> so, is it already too late? Well, again, I'm not sure that it's too late, but I just think we have to take a very clear-eyed look at what the, what the science and the math actually tells us. The problem is there's already so much excess heat in the seas. Remember I said over 90% of the heat ends up in the ocean, not in the atmosphere. So let's say tomorrow morning we, we simply stop emissions completely. Right? Let's say we even invent some kind of amazing technology that can suck 50 parts per million of CO2 out of the atmosphere in a short period of time. There's still so much excess heat in the ocean. It's just going to take a certain number of years for it to, eventually it radiates to outer space and the Earth goes back to equilibrium again, but it would take quite a while, right? So, you know, even if we stop everything today, that, that heat keeps eating away at the marine ice sheets from underneath. So you see why the scientists are saying that you know, when they say a meet, half a meter to a meter, that's a very conservative estimate, and they just don't know how bad it could get. Um, in terms of, again, if you look back at paleoclimate, if you go back to when the, the, uh, the uh, ice age collapsed about 14,000 years ago, they know there was a period of, I think, 400 years when the sea level rose um, 20 meters or so, like two, three, four meters per century. We know that that can happen because it has happened in the past. Obviously, it's rare, but the possibility exists. So the, there's a lot of discussion in the literature now about something that's called negative emissions, some technique of pulling gigatons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, only problem is the technology doesn't yet exist. It's only a name. There's no such thing. Um, yes, you can plant trees, all right? Um, trees are a good idea. Trees can pull some CO2 down, but again, the scientists have done the math. There's no hope of planting enough trees to pull enough CO2 down quickly enough. You get a few parts per million, maybe, if we did, if we went all in. If we, if we reforested every conceivable area of the earth that could be reforested, um, we, we'd, it would help a little bit, but, and it would be a good thing to do for other reasons, but it's not going to solve the problem by itself. 
Okay, so this is the, this is the background, this is the, the climate background to, to the question now what of energy policy, right? So uh, let's talk about energy a little bit. I call this from crude to crud. Um, basic fact, all right, we've had a good run off oil. Uh, obviously, personally, I've benefited a lot from oil in my life. Uh, but the fact is, most of the best quality oil has already been burned. Some people call it, we've picked the low-hanging fruit. That's a phrase that people sometimes use. So we are increasingly forced to move to high carbon fuels, such as the coal and bitumen. These, these increase carbon intensity, so some scientists have used the phrase the recarbonization of industrial society because we're moving more and more to higher carbon uh, forms of fuel. Now, there is still a lot of natural gas, particularly with fracking, um, but we flare it off or we use it to refine bitumen, a lot of it to refine bitumen. So declining quality of fossil fuels is yet another positive feedback in a sense that could tend to increase climate change. Here's what I think is the, 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 the really important thing. That, that the, um, sorry, just, I got ahead of myself here in my notes. Yeah. Okay, so. The important thing is, to me, the world won't wait for Alberta to figure this out. Right? Um, it's not going to sit by politely until we have amortized our investments in our oil sands operations, obviously. People need, the world needs energy. There happen to be other ways of producing energy. Some of these are available now. Some of them are just theoretical possibilities. Some of them need 5, 10, 15 years of R&D. There are people working on it all over the world, particularly in jurisdictions that don't happen to have a lot of their own fossil fuels, so they have no vested interest to protect. They just need the energy. So places like Japan, various European countries, China, they, I mean, China has lots of coal, but they know they can't burn it. They know how they have to get off it. So people are working around the world very hard to move beyond oil, and they're not going to wait for Alberta. Why would they? Okay. My personal guess, which I obviously can't prove, that the oil sands would be completely obsolete long before the resource itself is depleted. Obviously, I can't prove that. Mind you, the salvage and cleanup will provide hundreds of thousands of jobs for a generation or more. There must be a fortune in scrap metal up, up there. But, uh, you know, um, I can't see it going on for generations and generations, as the Premier said. I can't see that as a possibility. If we handle it proactively, intelligently, honestly, it will not cause an economic collapse, but more likely steady, predictable prosperity as we reinvest in replacements for oil, which we have to do. Okay, so, um, if we deny reality, then yeah, we're setting ourselves up for another bust. So, so getting back to what the Prime Minister said, I think I've got, how many slides, okay, i got just a few more slides left. Getting back to what the Prime Minister said, yeah, it would be very difficult for us to shut down the oil sands right now, obviously. I get that, I'm not stupid. He's not stupid either. But we do have to phase them out in the foreseeable future. I think that's inevitable, in my humble opinion. I think we have to. Both from the viewpoint of climate, protecting the ice sheets. We have no choice from the viewpoint of, if, 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 the, if you, the only thing you worried about was protecting the ice sheets, the only responsible level of emissions in 2030 is, is zero, not 100 megatons. If that was the only thing that you really cared about. And if you don't care about that, then what we're doing is we're gambling, right? And I think that we have to honestly admit to ourselves we're gambling. We're gambling that we can carry on with business as usual just a little bit longer until we can develop alternatives at a comfortable pace, right? Um, and that we're, we're gambling that the methane release won't get too bad. We're gambling that um, the ice sheets can hold out for a couple more decades. And we just don't know. I mean, I talked to a couple of the top glaciologists in the world. They don't know. They're scared silly, but they don't know for sure. They can't tell you how long it's going to take. My view, we have all our chips on the table for this. We're all in. So just my favorite quote from Dirty Harry. So you have to ask yourself, how lucky do you feel today, right? Um, so how can we shift the odds in our favor? If it is a gamble, think of it that way. What can we do to shift the odds in our favor? 
So I think there's a lot we can do, so long as we're absolutely honest with ourselves. Number, the bottom line is we have to innovate, innovate, innovate. Right? We just have to. And, I'm, and I don't mean, you know, better ways to recycle coffee cups. Right? It has to be a fundamental innovation in the way we produce, transmit, and store energy. But you want to say, how, how do you make this happen? Well, you incentivize it. So how can you incentivize innovation? Um, so I, the phrase I've, I've started to use is the concept of what I call push and pull. All right? um, so if you think of the carbon tax, in many ways it's probably a good idea to have a carbon tax. Some people don't like it. What does the park carbon tax do? It pushes you away from using fossil fuels. It's a disincentive to use fossil fuels, obviously. But what we also need is incentives to pull us toward non-fossil energy sources. And what I'm saying here is, is very simple. If non-fossil energy sources are cheaper to use, and if they are available, people will switch to them because they're cheaper, right? So a very, very good incentive is to lower the cost of alternatives. But this means you have to support the development of alternatives. Electric vehicles, for example, are already significantly cheaper to run than gasoline, their, their di gasoline or diesel alternatives. But the problem is the initial cost of the vehicles is prohibitive for most of us. So uh, I checked recently a Tesla S in Canadian dollars is $94,000. And that's the bare model without the, all the, the frills and things on it. So um, a couple of years ago, a friend of uh, Jim Burns came up from California, visited us here. He, dr he drove his Tesla S from Long Beach to, to Lethbridge. Um, he figured that at, I think it was 8 or 8.5 cents a kilowatt hour, he spent $65 in electricity to drive from Long Beach to Lethbridge, right? In a $100,000 car, <laughs> right? Now, here's the problem. So, so, but what happens when electric vehicles cost about the same thing as, say, a Kia or a Mazda 3 or something like that? Well, you can get a pretty good electric vehicle for 20, 25, 28,000. There, and let's say there's enough charging stations around. Why would anybody drive anything else? So, so wh what are the implica implications of that going to be for the demand for liquid fuels, diesel and gas? It's going to plummet, obviously, right? For a while, we'll still need diesel for heavy equipment, for a while. But don't worry, they're working on it. Now, I, just a couple of few days ago, I saw an article about John Deere has developed an all battery powered farm tractor. Uh, I don't know the exact weight of it. It looks like sort of a medium weight farm tractor. It's good for about three hours of service and then you have to charge it up again. It's not on the market yet, it's just a prototype. They need better batteries, obviously, but they're working on it. Please don't tell me that the batteries we have now are the best or the cheapest batteries that are going to be around five or ten years from now. An example I like to give, which is, uh, illustrates the how technological innovation works. I, I've been around long enough. I happen to remember that in the early 90s, a CD burner was a very radically new piece of technology. And in the early 90s, a CD burner cost, get this, about $30,000. Okay? Now you can go out to London Drugs or somebody like that and get one for, what, $30 or $40? They'll throw it in for free if you buy a computer. I mean, you know, that's a factor of about 1000 in price that it's dropped, right? This is going to happen to EVs, this is going to happen to many other forms of renewable or non-fossil energy technology as well. The, pri the prices are just going to keep going down. So here's a chart of the price of photovoltaic cells from 1977 to 2013. See, it's plummeted. Um, here's another chart I picked up from Bloomberg, okay? This is not from some radical left-wing site, this is from Bloomberg, all right? Battery prices are going down. So 2013, 599 per kilowatt hour. 2016, 273 per kilowatt hour. And that's going to keep going down. Right? This is partially driven by Tesla because they're building this gigantic battery factory in, in Arizona right now, which will you know, flood the market with cheap batteries. And, of course, the prices will go down. And this is what they want. So, so here's some suggestions, I would say, to create pull, right? before we all go off, you know, in absolute despair and, oh my God, you know, the methane burp is going to get all of us, uh, which it might, but uh, before we all give up, um, there's a lot we could do, Some th things we could do in Alberta. I would love to see subsidies for electric vehicles in Alberta. Uh, British Columbia and Ontario have subsidies 
So if you buy a, an electric vehicle in Ontario, I believe you get something like $12,000 back from the government. I mean, you have to buy it first, but um, why couldn't we do that here? Um, lots more charging stations, a lot more charging stations. Um, Tesla provides them for free for its own customers, um, but lots of other people are building charging stations as well. Um, here's my, one of my own pet things. I'd love to see a bullet train developed along the Lethbridge-Edmondson corridor. Um, and all renewable powered, of course. It was one of my pet peeves. I mean, I've traveled in Europe a little bit. I'm not a really big traveler, but I've been in Europe a few times. When you travel on trains in France and Italy, the comparison between what they have in here is simply embarrassing. And what we have here is simply embarrassing. There's no other word for it. We could have had a bullet train along the, uh, at least along the Edmondson Calgary corridor two or three times by now. Oh, oh no, it's too expensive. We can't do that. Well, I think now we really should do it. All right. um, this is, I think, what they already plan to do is use the proceeds from the carbon tax for renewable infrastructure, research and development. See, see one, one of the issues, if you, again, if you f follow this, is that what the engineers and the scientists will tell you is that th these things are developing in stages. So there's a number of technologies that are either on the shelf or almost on the shelf. So wind power now is presently the cheapest way to generate electricity. It's on the shelf. You, you just hire some people and they build it for you. Um, so solar power is not far behind. Um, there are other things that need to be developed. So for example, networks. We need to develop what's called the smart grid. So that if it's not windy here and it's windy over here, we can shuffle the power around efficiently. We need better storage methods. State of California is now, is now installing banks of Tesla batteries to hold the excess power. So in, peak per in periods when they have excess generating capacity, they store the power in batteries when it's needed, say on a hot day, it's hot business afternoon when there's a lot of air conditioning, they can flow it back into the system again. There's lots of other technical possibilities. And then beyond, th beyond that, there's, uh, there's some things that are more blue sky. There's all kinds of biofuels that people are working on. One of my colleagues at UofL, uh, Paul Hasendonk, knows a lot about this. There's many, many kinds of biofuels. I mean, I don't even know how many kinds of biofuels there are that, that could be developed. Um, there's also something a little bit more theoretical, but it's being worked on called artificial photosynthesis, whereby essentially you, what you need is a supply of electricity, you need some catalysts, which they're still under R&D, and it simply pulls carbon dioxide and water vapor out of the air and turns it into fuel alcohols or hydrocarbons. So imagine someday, I don't know when, you see on a, a farm, you see a bank of windmills, and there's some equipment down in one corner, and some diesel fuel is dripping into a tank at the end. Now, it's theoretically possible. There are people working on it. Again, they're not going to politely wait for us. They're going to keep working on it. Right? So um, these things are, are some, some of them, again, are either off the shelf or very close to being available. Others are in various stages of development. I mean, the ultimate source of energy would be controlled nuclear fusion, but it's still, it's still just a science project. There, I, mean, I, I mean, it's one of my pet topics, and I could get into it on another occasion, but it's not, the it's, important point is it's not ready yet. But, but there are a lot of things that we could do now. Very important thing, more education, more training. Um, no, there are discussions of a possible engineering faculty at U of L, which would be focused on renewable energy and other aspects of environmental engineering. This is a work in progress right now, but people are talking about this. Um, the bottom line for me, Ed, this is something I'm actually doing some writing on these days, human ingenuity is our greatest resource. We have to do everything we can to put it to work on this huge problem. So you have to enable people to innovate. And that will create the pull. That will create the alternatives and the incentives so that uh, you know, people won't have to keep on using fossil fuels indefinitely. The really big picture, you've all heard this phrase, we have to think globally and act locally. Sounds good. So I guess that means recycle your beer cans, etc. I'm, I'm all for that. My, what I would add, we also have to think globally and act globally. Right? So Alberta is, and certainly can be a global player and a leader in the move away from fossil fuels. We don't just have to sit back and wait for somebody else to do it for us, the typical polite Canadian way. Right? We, we can... We don't have to be that polite. We can lead, and we have to lead, right? Or wait for somebody else to do it for us and then pick up the pieces afterward. It's our call. So 
Anyway, there's, there's more I could say, but that's my basic message, or message, sorry. I'm a philosopher, I deliver messages. My family's sick of it, but anyway, that, I, I, I just, that's what I do. So, um, just, just, uh, I'll just say one more thing. I, I have a website, uh, and I've got a se section on my website called Stumbling into the Anthropocene, uh, in which I've, I'm, gonna, I'm posting some material to sort of back up or give more information on the things I've talked about. Um, I, I've just, it's, the website still needs a lot of work, but there's, it's up and running now. There's some things on it. My PowerPoint here will be posted on it. No, it is actually already posted on it. Um, our col my colleagues at UofL are, are videotaping this, and um, that's going to be on their website, and I will put a link to it, of course, on this as well. And I'm putting in lists of books and papers and articles and places you can go that I consider to be reliable to, to learn more about these kinds of things. Okay, so... So, so anyway, just one more thing. I think we're going to have a question period now. And um, how's my time? Yeah, I did okay. And I, we're going to have a question period now. And, and one thing I'd like to do is, when I've come to a couple of these other public prof events, the, 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 the folks at the front from U of L ask all the questions. And, and you guys can talk to me in the hall tomorrow morning. And I'd, I'd, I'd really like to hear from people who are not necessarily from U of L, or at this moment anyway, you know, just get questions from the general audience and, and uh, you know, have a bit of a discussion here. So, thank you, Kent. Okay. Thank you.